Last, but definitely not least for this course, we have Data-Driven Abductive Inference of Library Specifications by Zhu et al. again at Uppsala 2021. The problem that the authors are trying to address is reasoning in this program verification sense with preconditions and postconditions. But client code, but not just any client code, client code that uses libraries, where in fact the library specifications are not given. So let's look here at some client code that we might want to verify. So there's going to be a precondition and a postcondition, and you want to verify that the implementation satisfies the postcondition given the precondition. This is a simple concat method in a in OCaml. And the interesting about the thing about this is that it's going to call stack.isEmpty, stack.push, stack.top, and stack.tail. These are all functions in the stack library. And so what do we care about for this function? We might care, for instance, that if you concat two stacks, then the stack that you get the top value has to be one element of S1 and S2, and also that every element of the return value that you get from concat was in one of S1, S2, and also vice versa. So you don't get additional elements, and also you don't lose any elements. And the first one is that the, the top element was the top element of one of the two predecessor stacks. Where do these preconditions come from? Well, there's Part of the thing here is inferring postconditions. Uh, I think I said preconditions, but where do we get postconditions and preconditions? And the other thing is really you can ask developers to have at least preconditions and postconditions for their own code, even if there aren't any for libraries. And so let's say that we accept that this is a specification we want. We can express the postcondition that we stated on the previous slide formally with this formula. And we're going to call this formula phi concat. And it's going to have the two properties that we stated before. First, that the head of um, V is the, the output uh, stack, is the thing that was the head of one of the input stacks, S1 and S2. And that everything in all the members, mem, of, of V were members of either S1 or S2. All right, so we have a specification. It's a post condition. And the question is, how do we verify it? Well, there's techniques to do that, but there's an obstacle. There's many obstacles. The obstacle that the authors here are going to address is, well, this calls stack.isEmpty. And so the challenge is, what does stack.isEmpty do? Right. So the idea of this verification is to use the specification of the library function to understand what stack.isEmpty does. And that's kind of begging the question in the in the correct sense of the word. It's like, well, how do we know what it does? Well, we assume that specifications exist, but maybe they don't. And so libraries often don't come with specifications. Oh no. So what we want to do is somehow make do without specifications. And so what if we don't have the specifications, the unique best specifications for library code? Well, Okay, fine. What we want to do is we want to try to for some specifications based on client usages of library that are good enough to prove the property that we're trying to prove. And so the key idea of this paper is to infer specifications for libraries based on client usage, which are sufficient to show the desired properties. And so the client usage here is the call to stack dot is empty with s with um, with s one, and also this calls to stack push, stack top, and stack tail. And there's a challenge with that, which is the thing that we've seen in some other cases in this course too, the challenge of overfitting. So if we only observe client usages, we are susceptible to generate overfit specifications. As an example, we have the thing, if stack.isEmpty s1, um, then return s2, and maybe we don't have any test cases where s1 is empty, then we never get to um, we might generate specifications that always assume that S1 is empty, and that's not what we want, or that assume that always assume that S1 is not empty. All right, 
there's a lot of things that we have to understand to understand this paper, which makes it kind of challenging. But I thought I would throw in a couple of slides about what things mean. And so what's a predicate? Well, we have predicates here. So head, HD, is a predicate. And the head predicate is true. So it's it takes some arguments, V and U, and is true if for the collection V, U is the head of it. And so here we see V has um, U at the head implies that initially, so V is a return value, and um, initially S1 had U as head, or S2 had U, to head, U as the head. The other predicate is mem member, and so this says that if element U is a member of V on return, then it had to be a member of either S1 or S2 in the beginning, and vice versa. So if something was in either S1 or S2, then it has to be a member of V as well. And so I just said that. HD VU means that element U is at the head of 2 be return stack V. Great. So what does HD mean? Well, I said it in words, but what does it mean in terms of reasoning? In this case, it's associated with possibly black box implementations that we can use to check the specifications in which they appear. And so that means that in terms of reasoning, it's defined in terms of top and is empty, their implementations. And so how do we reason with that? We could use HD as an, something called an uninterpreted function symbol in an SMT solver. So basically what that means is you just take HD in your formula and the SMT solver, SMT solver is like, oh, there's an HD, I don't know what it is, meh. Uh, we'll just put the letters HD and we'll shuffle them around and everything's going to be fine. The problem with that is that it comes with zero semantics. And so we can write statements that are obviously not true of the implementation, but these, these SMT solver is fine with it. For instance, so the head is um, the top of the stack and you could infer that the thing that head returns is not the thing that stack.top returns, or the, the predicate HD and the top. And so these are obviously clearly linked. And if we just treat them as uninterpreted function symbols, then there's no guarantee that SMT solver is not going to work with that, um, that statement, which we don't want. So instead, what we want to do is we want to use the inferred specifications for libraries that we discussed earlier. And so there's other things that we want to understand. So we want to understand what is abductive inference from the title and what is data-driven inference. And so it, this paper combines both of them. It uses data-driven inference. And what that means is that it generates tests and it infers specifications from observed behaviors on these tests. Do I have an example? No, I don't have an example, but oh well, we'll continue. The other detail is what is abductive inference? And so I went to Wikipedia and I thought of an example. And so abductive inference in general is trying to infer causes for effects that we observe. And so right now in the UK, the number of COVID cases is ticking up again. And so abductive inference tries to figure out what is the cause of this recent uptick? So one cause might be, well, we pretended that COVID is over and it's not actually over. And so the number of cases goes up again because mask mandates are, are gone. Uh, specifically in abductive inference, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a statement that is consistent with observations. So that's inference in general, but that is sufficient to prove the desired verification conditions. And so, okay, let's just continue with our, our talk. So the goal here is to find a specification that is consistent with the observed behavior and safe with respect to post condition, which is also maximal. So let's just break that down. Consistent is the thing about abductive inference that we talked about. So we want no contradictions um, and we want it to be safe. So it doesn't cause any behaviors that um, are not allowed by implementations. And we want the most general statement that we can produce as well. All right, so the, their algorithm produces a uh, proceeds in two phases. The first stage is specification inference. So they create some statement and that statement might be too strong as in it's not general enough. 
And then the second stage is weakening. <coughs> Specification inference proceeds on a bunch of predicates at a time, and then weakening proceeds at one statement at a time. <sighs> All right, so they produced a tool, Elrond, and it generates this formula uh, for concat after simplification, but before weakening. I think it's before weakening, I can't remember. And so it is a bunch of parts. Let's talk about the parts of this formula. Again, there's a lot of background that we need for this paper to make any sense. So what we have here is a premise, um, sigma, but we don't actually use that Greek, Greek letter. And so that's kind of the, the thing that, the conditions under which the statement is true. And then it has a conclusion, which is all the thing after the big implication arrow. And the conclusion includes a post condition part, uh, phi concat, as we've seen before, which is the specific post condition of the um, function concat that we have. All right. The precondition, uh, or the premise, sorry has a predicate, which is an uninterpreted predicates, um, which relate parameters to return values. So basically these are the specifications of the functions that we call, is empty, top, tail, and push. And what these do is, so we have a predicate with a given name, r is empty. And what it does is it says that if you have a call with parameter s1, then it's gonna return value v is empty. And what you'd expect is that it's going to return true, which is going to be top, um, which is this sign, if the, if the set that you give it is empty, and it's going to return false, or this sign, if you give it a set that is not empty. Um, the other placeholder predicates should have similar meanings with respect to their semantics. All right, so we can look at this function again, or the formula again, and talk about the meaning of it all. So if the preconditions are met, then the result of calling concat must satisfy phi of concat. And so that's what this formula is telling us. And so again, I talked about uninterpreted predicates and how they have no semantics. And so what we need is some sort of, some sort of anchor for these semantics. And so we have to have some sort of, what we use here is some sort of implementations. These are black box implementations, which the Elrond system does not reason on, but it does, um, it does call them to, to see what happens under certain conditions, as far as I can understand. And so the overall goal of this paper, putting everything together again, is verification inf interface. So it infers the verification interface. And so here we have the four predicates for the functions, and we want to infer a interface for each of them. So a precondition, postcondition pair, uh, pair. And so we can see, for instance, for is empty, um, one interface that we can have for it is that for every element that might be in the thing, if um, the return value is true that implies that there's no members in that thing that's what empty means and then if the return value is false not v then there is recursively some element for which um, the element u is in the in the set i won't go over the other things so there are many possible verification interfaces one possible interface is bottom and it's safe but it tells you nothing about what these functions do. It captures zero behavior. So that's not a very useful interface to, to deal with. And so you want the best solution uh, using abductive inference. So you want the weakest self-consistent interpretation, which is sufficient to prove the verifica verification condition that you need in the client function that you're trying to prove, right? So there should be a picture of this, maybe on the next slide, no. But the approach is to use specification inference to get an answer. So you train Boolean classifiers um, on sets of example behaviors for each function, and then you get an answer, and then you weaken the answer to get better answers. Weaker is better, yes. So we train classifiers, and so we have some positive examples and some negative examples of, um, of possible interfaces. 
and so negative is like it shouldn't be that and positive is like it should at least include that behavior and the negative examples come from an SMT-based verifier. The positive examples come from a test generator. And so we have this space. And so clearly the things that come from the test generator are positive. And so you definitely want to account for them and more. And so you want to infer things. And then you have, some, you have the thick line. And that's the line of all things that are valid or safe, the maximum safe thing. And so if you infer more behaviors, then that is unsafe. So you don't want to be in that space. And then there's three interfaces here, which are in the safe space, safe, safe cons, and max. And so safe cons adds some more behaviors, but you want to be as close as possible to the line max or the, the thick line. And max is that example. All right, so we have a stack push specification. And so here's some possible specifications that we can just generate arbitrarily for it, kind of randomly. And so whatever, I don't really want to talk about them. But given these possible specifications, we can look at them and we can get a feature set which we're going to use in our, in our um, classification. And so we pull out all of, the, all of the possible predicates that we can get from it, HD, LU, MEM, LU, HD, V prime, U, mem vu x equals u and so we use those to get to do a hypothesis <coughs> to create a hypothesis space where we're going to do classification and so it can contain, contain for instance counter examples that we can produce from the um from the set of predicates that we have so this is a counter example and so this is a behavior that the library function definitely does not have and so if we look at this formula what it means is um, it's saying, hey, think about a case where you have v, the return value, v tail and v concat, each equal to the set containing a, then s1 and s2 contain the empty set. So if you concat the empty set and the empty set, you definitely should not get the set containing a. And so it violates the post condition of concat, which is output is at least one in one input. And so, yeah, a is in zero inputs. So what we have to do is we have to strengthen the placeholders to not allow that example. And so what we do is we take that counter example and we produce feature vectors, negative feature vectors, potential negative feature vectors from that. And so they call it multi-abductive inference because they infer uh, formulas for all of the predicates at the same time. And so then they have predicates and they try to figure out which other predicates are are going to be false by evaluating the predicates with respect to the um, the assumptions here and so you get some negative feature vectors and if they check out um, if they're consistent with the actual implementations then the classifier should classify them as negative examples they might they're only potential negative vectors for this reason and for another reason which we'll talk about in a bit there's also the notion of positive feature vector. So you want things that are negative and you want things that are positive. And so positive features vectors you generate using test generation. So we know how to do this at some level. And so you might say here, here's a case S1 equals the set containing A, S2 equals the set containing B. And then you just run, it's a test generation, right? So you just run this test and you get V equals AB and you get values for all the other things too. So these are actual examples and so they're definitely valid, right? That's great. But they don't tell you what's not in the space. They just tell you what's in the space, right? And so we can use them similarly as we use negative vectors to get um, examples which are classified positive. And so a feature vector might be both positive and negative. So we have a positive example. So treat it as positive. It's definitely positive. And what we want to do is we want to use standard, standard classification techniques to build a separator. And we do this many times. We use a counterexample generated guided refinement loop to get a separator between the positive and negative spaces. And that is our formula. The, the, the classifier gives you a formula. So it gives you a formula which is potentially too strong. It might be, for instance, that there's no duplicates in the output. And so that's the overfitting problem, right? So you have your, well, we'll talk about how you can create these things that are too strong, 
but they're too strong and they might get generated. And in fact, they do get generated, as we'll see in the results. And so why do we need to do that? Well, we might not see a behavior that ought to be allowed. So maybe the input space is too big and we just don't reach the interesting thing. Or the implementation that we're testing against never does the behavior that we want to, we want to not overfit to. And so it fits the implementation, but it doesn't fit the, uh, the desired specification of our method. And so how do we weaken? So the inference we did all predicates at a time, the weakening we do one predicate at a time, one predicate at a time. What we do is we generate weakening feature vectors as long as we can. And so we take a predicate and we try to weaken it, um, create feature vector for it. And so this example is showing that we ought to allow head of S1 equals one and um, recursive result equals one. So that's something that we add to that predicate. It's a thing that's allowed, right? And so if you do that, then hopefully you get the maximal specification, right? And so this is an example of the maximal specification. You can, if you feel uh, super into it, look at the slides and compare this to the specification we had before. And you'll see that this allows some things that the thing that we had before didn't. You know, that might be a good exam question. All right. So they implemented the system and I gave you an example I am not going to tell you how the thing works in general. You would not get anything out of it, and I'm not going to do that. But instead, we're going to go to the evaluation. So they implemented a tool called Elrond, I guess after the ELF, and it verifies OCaml programs. And their implementation contains 7,267 lines of OCaml and a backend solver. If I remember correctly, Elrond is a half ELF. I don't know if that's supposed to mean anything in the context of their tool. Um, so they do not infer inductive invariance for recursive client functions. So they do handle recursion in the context of the library functions, but not to the client functions. So you have to say what the invariant is if it's recursive. And again, it doesn't handle clients. It handles only libraries that are called from the spine clients. So you have to provide preconditions and postconditions for the clients. So they have five questions. Does Elrond work fast enough? Can it identify unsafe programs, clients? Can it find maximal solutions? Can it find intermediate generalizations of in initial specifications? And is weakening a win? And so here's their results. I'm not going to talk about this too long. I'm gonna talk about this in the context of particular questions. And then they also say, hey, look, our system really can do things. So given this client specification, Elrond infers this thing, right? So that's the thing it infers. It said, it, so it's a tree. Um, binary tree and so it says if um, if u is a member of the return thing v then either it's a member of the left hand side or the right hand side or it's the leaf uh, and then if u is a root then the, the, the tree is just u and if u is the um, root of the left subtree, then u is a member of L. And if if u is a member of the right subtree of is the root of the right subtree, then u is a member of the right subtree as well. Right, so they're like, hey, that's an interesting thing that Elrond can infer. Okay, so can it infer specification in general? So you have some programs which or some OCaml code which is reasonably complicated data structure implementations. But it's still pretty small programs in general, right? It's like, it's not toy programs, but it's also not industrial strength programs, right? It's like serious programs that we're doing complicated reasoning about. And so can we infer specifications for these functions? The answer is yes. So where we can see that is that um, the, okay, so I think that's the U column. And then, um, Yes, and reasonably quickly with the time that it does. Uh, if it's in red, then it's given an invalid post condition and counterexample, it found a counterexample. And the other question is what about weakening? So we had the three questions about weakening. And so uh, first question is if you allow, um, I should check this to make sure I get it right. Question three is 
starting at the initial solution, can you find the, um, the maximal solution within the limit? And for 16 and 22, the answer is yes. Um, and more complicated benchmarks equals longer to, to weaken the solution. Then the other column is, what's the total size of the space? So that's how many things the weakening thing did compared to the total space. And so weakening really helps make things faster. And then the last thing is, how hard is it to find something that's permitted by weakening? And so that's the time it takes for, for it to do that. Okay, so the other question is, are these specifications useful? And so the authors cross-check the inferred library specifications against their implementations using COC, the tool. And so of these specifications they found, 64 of the 68 verified. Uh, of these 64, three of them were too strong before the weakening phase. So the LRON returns the right thing, but you, you actually absolutely need weakening for three of the cases. And for the remaining four cases, what happened was weakening had timed out. So it's a specification that is correct, but maybe overfit. And so what they did was they inferred specifications for library functions called from clients using data-driven abductive inference. All right, so yeah, this paper is fairly sophisticated. We've said that it works on the space of OCaml programs, which is pretty specific, but it does fairly sophisticated, um, fairly detailed reasoning about these programs. And in that sense, it does improve on the state of the art in terms of inferring specifications. We will talk about this more in the discussion tomorrow. See you then.